Welcome to another episode of China Update, where I provide you guys with the most up-to-date political, economic, and geostrategic analysis on the world's number two economy. My name is Tony. Let's jump in. Okay, happy Tuesday, everybody. It feels like there could be a lot going on behind the scenes at elite political levels in Beijing this week. Let's unpack some of this. Yesterday, Monday, the powerful Politburo met to discuss the economy. Meeting earlier than many anticipated, the markets are watching closely for signals of large-scale stimulus, a theme which we've been following for some months now. The readout from the meeting is telling, putting on a brave face, but admitting that the economy is indeed an area of concern. Expressing, quote, the meeting pointed out that the current economic operation faces new difficulties and challenges, mainly due to insufficient domestic demand, difficulties in some enterprises' operations, more risks and hidden dangers in key areas, and a complex and severe external environment. After the stable transition of epidemic prevention and control, the economic recovery is in a process of wave-like development and torturous progress. End quote. The readout also stressed two areas specifically of deep concern, which will be familiar to regular China Update viewers. Quote, we must raise the strategic height of stabilizing employment to a comprehensive consideration. End quote, and quote, we should effectively prevent and resolve local debt risks and implement a package of debt plans. End quote. How should analysts and markets view this special economy-focused Politburo meeting? China's flagship state-run securities outlet, the Securities Times, provided its own analysis of the readout, explaining that seven signals were sent to the market from the Politburo. One. Increasing the activity of the capital market. Two, a clear signal of steady growth and to elevate stable employment. Three, monetary policy tools to be used in full force. Four, fiscal policy efforts on both ends and the implementation of a comprehensive debt solution for the local level. On this point, it is worth unpacking specifically what the outlet wrote. Quote, in the face of the increasingly prominent local debt risks since the beginning of this year, the meeting clearly stated that a comprehensive debt solution will be formulated and implemented, including that local debt risks will be properly addressed, sending a signal to hold the line against systemic risks. End quote. Five, major changes to the supply and demand relationship of real estate. Six, enhancing the fundamental role of consumption in driving economic growth. Seven, stimulating new momentum in digital physical integration, creating a new engine for high quality development. Though the piece does not explain what this specifically means, international commentators argue that while these are indeed all important issues to respond to, the meeting has yet still to provide much in specifics. Julian Evards Pritchard, head of China Economics at Capital Economics, for example, expressed in a note yesterday that, quote, "Given how bad things are at the moment, it's a bit disappointing that they didn't give us any specifics. China's leadership was clearly concerned, but they are not so desperate that they feel the need to resort to the old school big bang stimulus." End quote. Others agree. Quote, Overall, the Plip Bureau fell short of so-called bazooka stimulus. I don't expect a sustained impact on the market unless there is a series of strong, concrete steps. End quote. So that was the Plip Bureau. Now for the interesting twist. Also yesterday, Monday, a meeting of the Council of Chairpersons of the NPC National People's Congress Standing Committee. Presided over by the chairman of the NPC Standing Committee, triggered a special convening of the fourth session of the Standing Committee of the 14th National People's Congress for today, Tuesday, less than 24 hours notice. Thus, today, Tuesday, China's top legislature will convene a session to quote review a draft criminal law amendment and a decision on official appointment and removal. 
end quote. The China-based NPC Observer noted in a post yesterday that this timing is quite unusual. The legislative session, quote, was called just a day earlier, unlike the previous ones, which were all scheduled at least seven days in advance, as required by law in non-emergency situations, end quote. Other commentators have similar views. Quote, the language, decision on official appointment and removal, in these kinds of announcements is not that rare, but this announcement on the same day as the Plipuro meeting, and for only a one-day session to be held the next day, is unusual. End quote. Of course, this has led to much speculation that perhaps China's foreign minister, Qin Gang, who has not been heard from for exactly a month today, that is not since the 25th of June, may be about to be removed. Qin only came into the role in March, thus this would be a significant development. Quote, it doesn't really matter for other countries why he's gone, it's the fact that he has gone that is holding up diplomacy with China. The length of time that Qin Gang has been outside of the public eye is extremely uncommon. End quote. And this, of course, has serious political implications. Quote, the system is based on this idea that the party is always strong. When something doesn't go right, they don't know what to do. End quote. Bishop, who we just quoted, provided his own observations on this speculation, and it is just speculation at this point, earlier today. Quote, if Tian is removed, I would not be surprised if the reason given is health-related. No matter what is going on, since anything discipline-related would reflect badly on Xi and his decision to break protocol to promote Qin. But if Qin is removed for disciplinary reasons and is still alive, contrary to at least one of the rumors going around, would we even see or hear of him again? End quote. The next few days will indeed be very interesting. Next up, the Chinese economy. Hey everyone, if you enjoyed today's episode of China Update, as always, don't forget to hit that like button. These last few months, YouTube has not really been showing these episodes to new viewers, only to established, subscribed, or regular viewers. So if you know someone who would be interested in this sort of information, sharing with these sort of people is a huge help to keep the channel going and allow the channel to grow. And anyone who can go the extra mile and help keep the channel financially sustainable, Patreon and Buy Me A Coffee links are in the description below. As always, thank you so much, everybody, for all the support. U.S. financial media outlet Bloomberg reports today that, quote, global investors are returning to Chinese debt in full force as expectations for U.S. interest rates to soon peak and Beijing's monetary easing boost the appeal of the world's second largest bond market, end quote. According to the outlet's calculations, based on official local data, overseas investors bought a net 90.6 billion yuan, 12.6 billion US dollars of notes in China's interbank market last month, the most since January 2021, increasing their total holdings to 3.28 trillion yuan. The outlet explains that June marked the second consecutive month of such inflows, after foreign investors had continued to slash their exposure to Chinese debt following a record exodus last year. We covered this exodus at the time. Xing Jiaopeng, a senior China strategist at ANZ Bank, argues that the June inflows were driven by expectations for further rate cuts in China, expressing in a note yesterday, quote, We expect the Fed pause to boost demand for global bonds. The Chinese government bonds will benefit from inflows in the second half of this year. End quote. Now, moving from bonds to stocks, UK-based outlet Reuters reports, citing three unnamed sources, that the powerful China Securities Regulatory Commission has told law firms to tone down the language used to describe China-related business risks in Chinese companies' offshore listing documents, warning failure to do so could cost them regulatory green lights for the IPOs. The move comes as Beijing tightens scrutiny of Chinese companies' offshore listings and controls over cross-border transfers of sensitive information. This, of course, has serious implications if the report is accurate. At the very least, it presents the SEC in the US and similar bodies in other countries with a serious question. 
Can reviews from local Chinese law firms and accountants and other such bodies be considered reliable enough to meet review requirements for listing on their exchanges? And while we are discussing the China Securities Regulatory Commission, one last thing for today. Over the weekend, the CSRC hosted executives from more than 30 global venture capital and private equity firms at a rare symposium in Beijing to discuss investment in the economy. Details of the event were not published, but UK-based The Financial Times, citing five unnamed sources, reports that the symposium was part of a concerted effort by the authorities in Beijing to re-engage with foreign investors and businesses. The same day, China's Ministry of Commerce also held a roundtable discussion with more than 30 representatives from foreign companies, along with the Chambers of Commerce for the United States, the EU, Japan, South Korea and others. The Financial Times in a separate article reports that during the meeting, authorities did not offer specific incentives or guidance to these businesses and other representatives, but instead, the global investment groups were asked to share their outlook for China's economy and encouraged to suggest ways to make it easier to invest in the country. Okay, that is today's episode of China Update. Thank you so much, everybody, for watching. Have a wonderful Tuesday, and I will see you all tomorrow.